morning, everybody. We're going to jump right into worship this morning. Thanks for being here to Plum Creek. We want to welcome you. You're joining us online. We're so glad that you're tuning in. Our God loves us. He is worthy of our worship. Lift our voices and sing together. Nothing can separate, even if I run away, your love never fails. Though I still make mistakes, but you had mercy for me every day, your love never fails.
spoke a word you are singing over me you have been so so good to me before i took a breath you breathed your life in me been so so kind to me oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god oh it chases me down fights till i'm found leaves the 99 and i couldn't earn it and i don't deserve your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. Peace.
that time of year again, baseball season. Not much of it from the Reds, obviously, but as a father of a 10-year-old boy who plays, we had five games this week. And Buddy's on a new team, and this team's coaches are really good. They're very positive. And one thing I noticed was during one of the games is uh, one of the kids hit a, a pop-up. And uh, as it went out, he got caught. The kid got taken out, you know. He was, but the runner on third was able to advance and come home. And when the, the batter came around and came back, the whole team was cheering him on. Because although his hit was an out, it was a sacrifice to get the run across. And I think about baseball and all the great plays, but I love that idea of the sacrifice bunt, the sacrifice fly. Something that you're doing that costs you personally, but allows your team to get past and to maybe win. And we won that game, which was really great, but it really made me think about what sacrifice truly is. The giving up of oneself for someone they love. And when I read scriptures like this in John chapter 15, I see how Jesus truly loved us and was teaching us before he even did what he did for us on the cross. He says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit, but apart from me, he can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into a fire and burned. If you remain in me and in my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is in my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love one each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Before Jesus went to that cross on that hill, he already knew the sacrifice he was giving up for us. For the ones he loved, he was willing to give it all. And that's what we come to in this time of communion. Remembering that sacrifice, but also knowing that it is our job as followers of Christ to be sacrificing for the ones that we love. Not for our own advancement, but for the kingdom's advancement. So let's go ahead and take our communion together. We now come to our time where we are able to give back to God some of what he has given us. And if you are a guest here with Plum Creek, we just want to tell you there is no obligation for you to give during this time. But if you've been here for a while, you know that we love to see what God can do with our fruits and the things that we give back to him. And uh, so if you want to be able to give, you can go online to Plum Creek. Dot com and you'll be able to get through there. Or if you do have some money, we do have uh, a black box back there to give. And we just, we thank you so much. Because of the gifts that you give back to us, we're able to touch so many more lives beyond our reach here. We touch lives across the world, and it's amazing. 
With that being said, I'd like to make uh, two quick announcements. We have two events coming up here this month. We have a women's event and a men's event, and, uh, and we're really excited about them, and we're, we're put, uh, we have teams that have put a lot of time and effort into these, so we want to let you know a little bit more about it. So let's go ahead and watch this one video real quick. Let me tell you what I see when I look around. Darkness is everywhere. Walls are dividing us. Mountains are, are before us that we need to climb and we're all so tired. And there are lies that we are believing every single day. Darkness, walls, mountains, lies. And it, it's crushing us and it feels like it's closing in. But the interesting thing is, I also see in my Bible that God is more powerful than the lies we believe, that God is more powerful than the mountains that we need to climb, that He is more powerful than the darkness that surrounds us and the walls that are dividing us. And I believe if we could believe that, it would change everything. So we do not want you to miss If Gathering, and here's why. Because we're going to come together, and faith grows when we come together. And we're not just coming together, a few of us. We're coming together around the globe. Last year, 144 countries joined us. Women all over the world. Over a million women gathered together. Guys, and this year will even be more. And you tell me that's not going to change things. You tell me that that doesn't change things. A million women around the world believing God, that changes the world. So you are not going to miss it because we are going to watch God together, bring truth to the lies that we've been believing, help us scale the mountains that we have before us, bring light to the darkness that we feel pushing into our lives everywhere, and to tear down the walls that are dividing us. It can happen, I believe it, you'll see it. If you join us, come on. So that's our ladies' event, our women's event that's coming up here May 14th. Please sign up for that as soon as possible. It is going to be <clears throat> here all day over in the Life Center and other break, breakouts. And so we want you to get a part of that. Also, we have a men, Man Up men's event coming up as well. Um, Saturday, May 21st from 3 to 7 p.m. We're going to have a lot of great things going on with this. Uh, there's going to be a handgun range, some clay pigeon shooting, some archery, leatherworking, mechanical bull. Anybody want to do that? Yeah? Anybody, make sure you've got your chiropractor scheduled the next day. But it's going to be an awesome time. Axe throwing metal, some metal forge. We're going to have smoked meats, jerky bar, and a keg of root beer. This is for 13 and up. So just be mindful of that for 13 and up. Um, but you can also sign up at uh, plumcreek.org slash man up. We want you to come and to bring some friends. These are some great uh, opportunities for you to introduce people who don't know Jesus to a bunch of people who do know Jesus and it, to a place where they can encounter God. So let's go ahead and pray and then we'll continue our service. Father God, we thank you for bringing a, great, a, a, a greatness to us through your son. Lord, I ask that you would just bless us in everything that we do. Let's be able to focus on you. And let's be able to do our best to be you to the people around us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. everybody. It's great to have you with us today. I want to say welcome to all of you, whether you're here in person or you're watching online. Man, uh, we got a lot of good stuff coming up in the month of May around here. Uh, I think it's going to be a great month. And we just keep praying that God will use us to help his kingdom grow, that, that we can work for his kingdom as a church. And along those lines, I want to say thank you to anyone who made a contribution to our special offering to send help to Ukraine. Uh, I talked about this last Sunday. Uh, through one of our mission partners, we have a connection with a church near the western border of Ukraine, and they're ministering to families who are refugees, escaping to find a safe place to live. And uh, I've stayed in contact with Zhenya, our mission partner, and he told me about a family that he encountered this week. I wanted to share this with you. Zhenya said he met three ladies from Kharkiv, a, a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter. 
and the mother couldn't stop crying. She would not share why. Finally, she did calm down, and she explained the situation. They had been traveling for three days already. Her husband had just been killed in an air attack. Their house was no more. Life as she knew it was gone. And Genya said, The hug she gave me after wiping her tears was strong, and I did not have much to say. I prayed for God's angels to be with them during their travels. So Genya helped them catch a bus to Warsaw, Poland, where they're now staying with relatives. And there are countless stories like that one. It's heartbreaking. But through all of this, followers of Jesus are stepping up to show God's love. And you guys are a part of that. As of today, our offering total is almost $3,600, which is well over the goal of $2,000 we set last week. Uh, We'll close donations today. We'll wire the money over tomorrow. And this church is using that money to buy food and medicine and basic supplies. And they're also sharing the gospel with these families. So let's keep praying for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. And let's pray for everyone who's affected by this war. And again, thank you for making a difference in the name of Jesus. Well, this morning we're continuing our series called Kingdom Coming. And we're going to look at a fascinating parable that Jesus told. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, That's uh, where we find this parable. And, And to illustrate the story, I wanted to bring along a little souvenir that I've had for a long time. Over 20 years ago, I went with a group to visit Israel. And we had the chance to visit Bethlehem. And as you can imagine, it was very cool to see the neighborhood where Jesus was born. But while we were in Bethlehem, I went to a little shop, and I bought a small lamp. It was a terracotta clay lamp like the ones they used in Bible times. And the good news is, I still have this lamp. It's in my basement. The bad news is, I have no idea where it is in my basement. I'm confident that it's in a box. I just don't know which box. And hopefully some of you can feel my pain here. But even though I don't have a 3D version of this lamp, I can show you a picture. So this is what I'm talking about. Uh, People in first century Palestine, they use these kinds of lamps all the time. Uh, They're about three inches in diameter. You've got a wick on one side and that hole there, you pour oil into that and the oil serves as your fuel. Now, I wanted you to see this because lamps like these play an important role in the parable that Jesus tells here in Matthew 25. And now that you have this image in your mind, let's read the story. We'll start with verse 1. Jesus is talking here and he says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Okay, we already have some things to talk about here. First, I should have given you a heads up. If you are an American living in 2022, you may find it hard to relate to this story because their culture at that time was very different than ours. Uh, First century Jewish world, it's foreign to us. But that goes both ways, right? Think about it. Uh, Imagine you going back in time and telling them a parable. I imagine standing in front of a a first century Jewish crowd and saying, once upon a time, there was a young man who was TikTok famous. Right away, they'd have no idea what you're talking about. And that's kind of what we have going on here in Matthew 25. Uh, Jesus introduces us to 10 virgins, 10 lamps, and a bridegroom. So what's he talking about? Well, we'll get to that, but first, we need a little background. From the very beginning here, Jesus tells us this parable, it's not really about virgins, lamps, and bridegrooms. It's about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that's yet to come, the the final, fully realized, eternal version of the kingdom of God. And this is just a continuation of what Jesus has been teaching about. Uh, Back in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was telling his disciples about this coming kingdom. And throughout Matthew 24, he made several statements like the one we find here in verse 42. 
Jesus said, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And if you were here last week, you know that Jesus is talking about himself here. This is a reference to the second coming. Forty days after Jesus rose from the dead, he went back to heaven to be with his heavenly Father, and he went to prepare a place for his followers. But one day, Jesus is coming back. The Bible calls this the day of the Lord. And after the return of Jesus, God's kingdom will arrive in its fullest form. He will destroy all of his enemies, and he will reign and rule for all eternity. Now, as we see in this verse, we don't exactly know when Jesus is coming back, uh, but he did give us a few signs to look for. In Matthew 24, he talked about wars, famines, earthquakes, false teachers. But now, many of those signs are very general, so it's hard to narrow down a specific time frame. However, Jesus did give one sign that's a little more specific, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But back to the parable. Let, let's start again. Matthew 25, verse 1. Jesus says, at that time, and what time is that? It's the time of the second coming, the, the, the coming kingdom. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. Okay, so now it's time for a little context. First, the word virgin here, it just refers to a young, unmarried girl. Uh, and for the purpose of this story, just think of these virgins as bridesmaids, bridesmaids in a wedding, because that's actually the context here. Uh, Jesus describes a typical first-century Jewish wedding. And like I said, their culture was very different than ours. Most of the time, their marriages were arranged by the parents. So you'd have two fathers talking to each other, and one of them would say, hey, how about my son marries your daughter? What do you think? And if the other dad agreed, they would negotiate a fair price for the bride. Yeah, I know. And if the negotiation was successful, the, the couple would be engaged or betrothed. Now, you may or may not like this idea, but the truth is it, it happened all the time. And once the couple was engaged, the future husband, also known as the bridegroom, would go and prepare a new home for him and for his new bride. And when that home was ready, they would set a wedding date. Now, a first century Jewish wedding, it was not some 25-minute ceremony with a little reception afterwards. Now, these weddings would usually last a full week, sometimes more. And, and they would often start with a ceremony at the bride's house. And then after the ceremony, the groom and his friends would have this big procession. It, it would be like a parade from the bride's house to the new home that the groom had prepared for his bride. So what about these virgins, the bridesmaids? Well, the bridesmaids had the job of waiting at the new house for the groom's procession to arrive. And each one of those bridesmaids had an oil lamp with them. Because in the story here, the procession took place at nighttime. Now, they had no idea how long it would take for the bridegroom to arrive. And, and you can see the symbolism here, right? In, in this story, Jesus is the bridegroom. And we are like those bridesmaids, the ten virgins. Uh, just like these ten virgins, we're all invited to the party. We're invited to the wedding banquet at the kingdom of God. Now, right now, Jesus, the bridegroom, he's away. He's preparing a place for us. And we don't know exactly when he's coming back. It's interesting this wedding metaphor, it shows up not just here, lots of places in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. One clear example is in Revelation chapter 19, which is another description of the coming kingdom. Revelation 19 verse 9 says, Blessed are those that are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. At the wedding supper, God's people will celebrate the beginning of an eternity with Jesus. But back to the parable. In verse 2, we saw that there were five, five wise bridesmaids and five who were foolish. 
But then in verse 3, the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, as these bridesmaids waited for the groom to arrive, each one of them was expected to have one of these lamps. If you didn't have a lamp, you'd be sitting there in the dark, and people might assume that you're just a a wedding crasher. And right here, we need to remember, these clay lamps were small. They, They would only hold about a tablespoon of oil. So if you needed to burn this lamp for a long time, you better have some extra oil with you. And that's where the foolish bridesmaids ran into trouble. They didn't bother to bring any extra oil, and as time went by, the fuel ran out. And when the bridegroom finally arrived, these girls were in trouble. Look at verse 6. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. You kind of feel bad for the foolish bridesmaids, don't you? When they trimmed their lamps to increase the flame, that wick just sucked out the final drops of oil. And what do you think about the wise bridesmaids? Not very generous, are they? They were like, no, go buy your own oil. And that's kind of a strange plot twist, because remember, Jesus is telling this story. He's making it up, and he can tell it however he wants. You you might think that Jesus would tell a parable that teaches the value of sharing and generosity. So this is a little strange, but here's what's going on. It's definitely true that all over the Gospels, Jesus teaches us to be generous. But here in this parable, he's teaching a different lesson. A preacher named Brady Herbert put it this way. He said, there are some things in life that can't be borrowed from others. You can't borrow a good reputation. You can't borrow someone's character. You also can't borrow another person's faith. And that's the point here. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 10. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So in the end, the wise virgins were prepared for the bridegroom's return, and the foolish virgins were not ready. And because they were not ready, they didn't make it into the wedding banquet. Now, remember, all ten of them were invited, but only five made it inside. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, don't try to find some hidden meaning. The parable is pretty straightforward. A day is coming when Jesus will return, and you need to be ready. If you're not ready, you can't borrow that readiness from someone else. So watch, because not everyone will make it to the party. Not everyone will enter this coming kingdom and spend eternity in the presence of God. So I have to ask, does Jesus have your attention here? Are you totally sure that you're ready for Jesus to return? I have to ask that because there's a pattern in this world. Many people are not ready for the inevitable. And that's true in several areas. But let's talk for just a second about death. I think we all know that death, it's inevitable. Unless Jesus returns in our lifetime, 100 out of 100 people will die eventually. But many of us haven't done much to prepare for that event. Last Sunday, Plum Creek hosted a legacy planning seminar. It was very good, and and I was really surprised by a statistic they shared. They said 67% of Americans don't have a will or some kind of plan for how to handle their money and their things after they die. Uh, That is a very sad thing for several reasons, And, and I'll give you just one reason. If you're an average American with what they call a routine estate and you don't have a good plan in place, 
You can easily spend tens of thousands of dollars handing, handing it over to the government or to attorneys through probate. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you do have a good plan, you can take that same money and give it to a charity or a church or a ministry that you believe in. So why would people not prepare for the inevitable event of their death? Well, there could be several reasons. Maybe these people aren't informed. They don't know their options. Maybe it's uncomfortable to think about the subject of death. Or maybe life just gets busy and they put it off. They just assume that they're going to have time to take care of it later. The bottom line is, this is very common. Many of us are not great about preparing the, for the future. But when it comes to the second coming of Jesus, we can't afford to be unprepared. This is far too important. So in the time that we have left, I want to address three groups of people who need to get ready. Three categories. And if you're either in one of these categories yourself or you know someone who is. So here's category number one. The first group of people who need to get ready for the second coming are the people who say, I got plenty of time to get right with God. Now these people, they may believe in Jesus, but they don't have any sense of urgency about his return. And in a way, I understand. In the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I am coming soon. But we talked about this last week. The book of Revelation was written over 1,900 years ago. So from a human perspective, it really doesn't seem like Jesus is in a hurry. And because of that, some people doubt that he's coming back at all. But there's a chapter in the Bible that's really important for anyone who is not ready for the return of Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 3. And as we think through these different categories of people, we're going to read a little from 2 Peter 3. And, and we'll start with verse 3. It says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And they will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. This is what scoffers do. They look around and they say, for thousands of years, people have been freaking out about the apocalypse, but somehow the world keeps spinning. We're all still here but for anyone who thinks along these lines, I have two things to share. Number one, God always keeps his promises. He has a perfect track record. And when Jesus says that he's coming back, it's not wise to bet against him. But here's the other thing I would share. Even if we're not in the end times, you are in your end times. Think about it. Where will you be 100 years from now? You and me and just about all of us will be gone, except maybe a couple babies that we have here this morning. Now, it's possible that the world will end sometime in the next 100 years. That, that could happen, certainly. But even if we're not living in the end times, you are in your end times. And you're not even promised tomorrow. So be prepared. Now, the second type of person who needs to get ready is the one who says, I'm sure I'll be fine. I'm a good person. And this mindset is pretty common today. You just feel like everything's going to work out okay. You feel like you're a pretty good person, all things considered. And if God is truly loving, he will accept you just the way you are. Now, the Bible does teach that God is loving. In fact, he's the embodiment of love. But because of God's perfect love, he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. A good judge will punish criminals. If you let people off the hook for no good reason, you are not a good judge. So because of God's goodness and his love, he has to punish sin. That's what his character requires. And then where does that leave us? Well, think about the Ten Commandments. Have you ever lied at any point in your life, even a small lie? If so, you'd have to call yourself a liar. 
And I'm not leaving myself out here. I'm, I'm right there with you. What about stealing? Have you ever stolen something, anything? Maybe back in school, you cheated on a test once or twice, which is stealing answers from the person sitting next to you. If you have stolen, that makes you a thief. I'll give you one more. Jesus said, if you even look at someone with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. I could go on, but the simple fact is we are all sinners. We are what the Bible would call ungodly. We deserve to be punished for the wrongs that we've done. And going back to 2 Peter chapter 3, we need to look at what's coming in the future for those who are ungodly. We just read verse 3, where Peter talks about the scoffers that don't believe in the second coming. But in verse 5, he goes on to say, but they, these scoffers, they deliberately forget that long ago, God, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. That was creation. And by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. That's in the time of Noah. And by the same word, the power of the word of God, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So Peter looks way back to the time of Genesis. And back in the days of Noah, God punished the ungodly by sending a worldwide flood. In the future, though, God won't use water. He will destroy this present world with fire. And do you notice, do you notice who's going to be destroyed along with this present world? The ungodly. And like I said, that word ungodly includes all of us. And unless someone can save us from this future, that's where we're headed. We're, we're headed for destruction. We're going to be shut out of God's kingdom, spending eternity separated from God in hell. Now, some people might accuse me of using scare tactics here, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just sharing what Jesus taught. It is true that Jesus preached a message of love, but part of that message was the reality of hell. In fact, Jesus talked about hell more than any other person in the Bible. Read through the Gospels. Jesus said hell is a place of eternal torment, Luke 16, 23. A place of unquenchable fire, Mark 9, 43. A place where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, Matthew 13, 42. Now, how is it loving for Jesus to teach these things? Is, is that a fear-based message? And isn't it judgmental for Jesus to say that we don't deserve to, to be in heaven? Well, an evangelist named Ray Comfort has a good analogy here. What if you and I were up in, a pair, in, up in an airplane, and you were about to jump out of this airplane without a parachute? And then what if I ran over and I pulled you back and I said, hey, you need this parachute. If you don't use it, you're going to die. Now, would that be a fear-based message? Would that be judgmental? Not at all. It would just be stating things as they are. I'd be doing my best to help you get ready to jump out of the plane, which is, in the end, a very loving thing to do. And that's why Jesus told this parable. He loves you, and he wants you to be ready. All of us are invited to the wedding banquet but not all of us are prepared. We're not good enough to be there. We deserve to be destroyed along with the ungodly. But look again at 2 Peter 3. Peter is still talking about these scoffers, the ones who don't believe that Jesus is coming back. And he says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So no, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Isn't that a great verse? Despite the fact that all of us are ungodly sinners, God is still patient with us. He loves us. In fact, Romans 5.8 tells us that 
God didn't wait for us to, to clean up our acts before he would accept us. Uh, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid that penalty himself. He took our sin on his shoulders. And because of that, we don't have to be destroyed. It's the gospel. It's the good news. It's the best news ever. No one is good enough, but through the sacrifice of Jesus, God still invites us into this coming kingdom. And this is the way to be ready. The only way to be ready for the return of Jesus is through a life-changing relationship with Jesus. God invites you to receive the gift of salvation and take your place at the wedding banquet. But you do have to accept the invitation. So how do you accept? Well, the Apostle Paul says it well in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Paul says, For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith. And it's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. So there it is. You're, you're saved by the grace of Jesus. It's a free gift through faith in Jesus. And we need to be clear about this word faith. In the Bible, faith is not just belief. Faith is belief plus trust. It's like that parachute. You can believe that the parachute would save you from falling to your death, but you're not trusting in that parachute until you strap it on and then jump out of the plane. That's when you're trusting, and that's what faith is. In the New Testament, we see several steps that people take when they put their faith in Jesus. This is what you do. First, you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior. Second, you confess your faith. You declare that Jesus is your Lord and your Master and your King. You also repent of your sins. You do a 180. You turn away from your old sinful life. And finally, you're baptized by immersion. And sometimes people get hung up on this particular step, but Jesus told us to do this. So I want to say a word about it. In the early days of the church, in, in the book of Acts, baptism was a normal part of becoming a follower of Jesus. And people being baptized, they were old enough to make their own decision. And when the time came, these people were immersed in water, completely submerged and then brought back up. That's what the word baptism means. It means immersion. But now what does being dunked in water have to do with becoming a follower of Jesus? That's a great question, and the Bible has a great answer. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, we read this. Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So when we're baptized, it's like we're in a drama. And in this drama, we play the role of Jesus. And just like Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and then rose up to have new life, you die to your old sinful life, you're buried in water, and you rise up to live a new life. It's, it's a direct connection to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we're going to see someone take this step later today, and if you need to take this step as well, we'd love to help you do that. But I need to wrap this up by speaking to one final group that needs to get ready. It's category number three. It's the person who says, yeah, I, I do consider myself a Christian, but it doesn't really change how I live my life. And this one is actually heartbreaking because many people, they believe that they will be welcomed at the wedding banquet, but they're actually going to be shut out, just like those foolish bridesmaids. Jesus said this himself over in Matthew chapter 7. And listen, don't get me wrong here. Salvation is by grace. It is a gift. It's not by works. We're not saved by trying to be good enough. But here's the thing. When you truly put your faith in Jesus, you become a new person. Your life is transformed by the grace of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, will you live a perfect life? No, of course not. And the grace of God will cover that. But make no mistake, when you truly give your life to Jesus, you will change over time. You will become more and more like him. And this is a huge danger in the American church today. Too many people look at God's grace 
as a license to sin. I can do whatever I want because God will forgive me, right? Sin really isn't that big a deal. But sin is a big deal. And through the power of the the Holy Spirit, we need to fight the temptation that's all around us. Right now, the world is trying to redefine sin. But that's God's call. If the Bible calls it sin, it's sin. So check your heart right now. If you are currently embracing sin or you're not resisting temptation at all, you really need to question whether you've truly put your faith in Jesus. And if you haven't really put your faith in Jesus, you're not ready for him to return. This week, I've been praying that God would use this sermon to convict each one of us. If you're not ready, get ready. If you are ready, focus on doing what God has called you to do. I want to read just one more thing from 2 Peter 3, verse 11. It says, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Followers of Jesus ought to live holy and godly lives. You know, some people think that a holy life is about trying really hard to not do bad things. But it's so much more than that. It's about letting God use you for his kingdom, for his glory. And look at the last verse that I read there. There's a funny phrase in this verse. It says, live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Isn't that interesting? How could we speed the coming of Jesus? Well, this is that sign that I mentioned earlier, what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations, to all people, and then the end will come. Now, we talked about some different opinions about that verse, some different interpretations, but as you look across the entire Bible, this is what we see. It does look like God is delaying the return of Jesus until every people group has the opportunity to hear the gospel. Remember what we read just a few minutes ago in 2 Peter 3. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to know that they are invited to the party, to the wedding banquet. Last week, we also read from Revelation chapter 9. We see this concept there, too. In that chapter, we see people of every nation, every ethnicity, tribe, and language. They're all going to be present in the coming kingdom. That's a guarantee. It's a reality. And in the meantime, between now and then, God has given his church a mission. We go into the world and we make disciples of all nations. And as we do that, through God's power, we somehow speed the return of Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus is the one who decides when that mission has been completed. Uh, We don't know exactly when he's going to return, so we need to be ready all day, every day. What we do know is that Jesus is coming back, and he left us with some important work to do. Next week, we'll focus on the last part of that statement. But for today, let's all make sure that we are ready. Let's pray. Father, it's so easy to not think down the road, to be prepared for the future in lots of different areas. But Lord, let this truth sink into our hearts that this world is so temporary. And and we need to be living for your kingdom here and now, but also ready for the coming kingdom, the the fully realized version that, that continues for all eternity. Lord, help us to to see this life more the way you see it. Help us to see this world more the way you see it. Help us to, to have this desire not only to be at the wedding banquet, but to see people from all nations at the wedding banquet as well, so that we can be in your presence worshiping you forever. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's several things you can do with the message that Jesus tells us in that parable. It it may be that you need to repent and get serious about some unconfessed sin in your life. 
And maybe you need prayer about that. Maybe you need to connect with someone else who can hold you accountable. Maybe you need to take that step to be ready for the first time. Put your faith in Jesus. You know, respond in the ways that we saw today. And if you need to do that, again, we'd, we'd love to, to talk with you and help you through that process. Uh, after the service is over, you could stop by the Connection Cafe on your way out. Uh, we'd be glad to meet you there, pray with you, just talk to you. If, if you're new here, just stop by and meet us. That would be great. But now let's stand and worship together. Oh, 
Today, goodbye. If you have a decision to make, make this your day. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Thanks so much for being with us. Have a great week.